Hi, I'm Lauren Erickson, and I'm here today to talk to you about a day in the life of Joe. Joe was conceived as a spokesperson for older adults. The goal for Joe is to represent a cross-section of different people with unique backgrounds and histories. Millennial had a whole different meaning for the term than what we have today. 1999 was the international year of the older person. We were on the cusp of Y2K, and the new millennium was upon us, hence Millennial Joe. His contemporaries, who are still living, continue to influence our perceptions about aging. He has learned a great deal about the aging process and how environment directly affects quality of life. A few of his contemporaries are Betty White, who's still going strong at 94, Queen Elizabeth II at 90, Harry Belafonte at 89, and the original Gerber baby, Ann Taylor Cook, who turned 90. Joe had a strong knowledge base, and he continued to build upon it for himself, his family and friends, and his community. Now we're going to hear from Jane Rohde and Maria Lopez about Inspirational Joe. Hi, I'm Maria Lopez, and this is Jane Rohde. And we are here to talk to you about A Day in the Life of Joe, Volume 2. At 62, Joe was a widower of six years, reflecting upon his life and his future. He had completed his military service and entered the social work and home health fields, eventually becoming an adult daycare administrator. Joe paid close attention to the aspects of aging from social, medical, and regulatory perspectives. Joe was a caregiver for his 89-year-old father and a frequent visitor to the nursing home where his wife had lived. He visited his best friend, Mel, who lived in HUD-sponsored subsidized housing. He has a relationship with Josephine, who is three years older. 18 years have passed and Joe is turning 80 and he still serves as our spokesperson for healthy and successful aging. So a lot of changes have taken place, but Joe is still vibrant and involved 18 years later. He and Josephine got married in 2007. Josephine is now 83 years old. Uh, combined, they have five children and 10 grandchildren. All of Joe's three kids are married. One couple is living local and two couples are living out of town. The local son and daughter have three kids. One out of town son and daughter have four kids. They are living in Austin, Texas, and their other out of town daughter is living in Chicago with her partner. The rest of the grandkids are part of Josephine's son and daughter's families. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. <laughs> to take care of Chicago. <laughs> uh, after Joe and Josephine married, uh, they moved into an urban setting. They wanted to be closer to their friends and uh, services and amenities. They decided to move after Josephine was diagnosed with high blood pressure and Joe was diagnosed with diabetes. They decided being closer to health and wellness activities uh, would be best for their uh, future. In uh, 2010, Joe lost his friend Mel, unfortunately, who had uh, moved from his HUD, independent living HUD property uh, to a nursing home because he had suffered a stroke. Joe and Josephine live in a condominium with a marina view. Uh, that's where they keep Josephine's boat. The marina staff maintain the boat, which are used mainly by um, Joe's son and Josephine's daughter who live locally. Uh, the rest of the family comes to visit for their annual reunion. They tend to go out sailing. That's when they get to do their little sailing activities. Otherwise, Joe and Josephine really don't get out on the boat very much anymore. So it's really important for them to be able to interact with the kids. And exactly. That the adult children are taking notice and actually really involved in their family. So they're right. very lucky in that way that they have some local kids. And the, and the boat's a big draw. It's a lot of memories for them. Yes, for many years. Exactly. So, Jane, we've been talking about um, Joe's profile, but what's his spirit like now in 2017? Well, it's changed a little bit since his perspective of 1999. So Joe and Josephine see their kids a lot, so regularly, and so that's really important to them and the grandkids. Joe still drives, but Josephine had to stop the driving. So that's made it a little bit different in terms of how they've looked at transportation and transportation services. So they use Uber to go out at night because they don't like, neither one of them like to drive at night. And unless they ride with friends, sometimes they're adult children, but usually they like the independence of using Uber. So that's been a great aspect. Well, and it's a great thing because they realize that they're not spending any time looking for parking or paying for parking, it's really like a chauffeur service for them. Exactly, and not having great. to worry about weather or worrying about other things too. So, or a little, you know, if they want to, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. So Because they've earned it. And they earned it, right? And so Joe knows that at some point he'll have to give up driving, um, which also supports that decision that they made to move into that urban environment. Josephine's always on Facebook. You know, she's texts with her friends and her family. She likes to keep up on what's going on with everyone. And, and it also allows, she likes the celebrity stuff. So she really likes to follow, you know, what's going on with Leonardo and whoever. And so her Facebook allows her to stay current on all those different issues. 
Um, Joe also likes to help his son with business. He tries not to overcome and be too strong with his business, but he likes to give him some good advice, some sage advice, uh, supporting older adults while they remain in at home with services. All his background in the adult adult daycare world has allowed him to be able to do that for his son. And so he uses LinkedIn and email predominantly. He leaves the rest of the social media to his sons, his grandkids, and to Josephine. But I think he's probably pretty good at getting his research done online, you know, taking a look at what uh, is available um, because he wants to know what's out there and what other opportunities are available. Um, so that kind of research I think he's still doing online. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense too because then I think he can be relevant right. and still use his experience as part of that to be able to help his son build his business. Exactly. So Joe visited his good friend Mel. He lived in a long uh, institutional long-term care setting, uh, not one of the primary places where Joe would really like to see his friend. So being that Joe worked in the long-term care marketplace, uh, he and, and Josephine have been advocating for supporting person-centered and other alternatives to care, predominantly with their relationship that they had and the, what they saw happening to Mel really made them upset that the long-term care industry hasn't moved further faster. So I think that they've been really looking at that as well. And so they've been seeing some most of the institutional models. They also mimic the hospital type setting. They sure do. They don't look at how we live. You know, we live in a home. We don't live in a hospital. And so looking at that movement of culture change toward resident-centered care has become one of their passions. And I think more for Joe than for Josephine, but Josephine definitely sees the impacts and is very supportive of Joe's desire to have more knowledge in that area. Exactly, exactly. So the industry's really changed quite a bit. Um, as we've been getting to know Joe. Can you talk a little bit about some of the changes in the industry, what's, what's been happening and what has progressed and maybe things that haven't progressed the way we would like them to? So I'd be happy to look at that, Maria. Uh, so I'd like to give some history in that. So if we look at the context of not only history repeating itself, but definitely healthcare history has repeated itself as well. In 1937, Social Security had been established. Um, almshouses were still being used at the time, and they weren't particularly very nice places. Um, however, the government decided they were going to abolish these institutions, forcing residents into privately funded homes. And though it might not sound familiar, you'll see that it gets more familiar as we move forward in history. So those living in almshouses would be barred from receiving their financial support, so basically their pensions, so that they could basically get them to force them to close. And residents that lived in privately funded homes for the elderly and the firm, they could actually be beneficiaries of pensions. So the government then thought that most older people could simply live independently. And you and I both <laughs> right. know that that isn't really what happens. So something that had been pointed out by Homer C. Folks was actually one of the first sociologists in New York City who actually realized that people weren't living in almshouses because necessarily because they were poor, they were living them because they needed services. So it's very similar to how our nursing homes are today is that people don't choose to necessarily live in them, they need to because they need help with either care or services or per perhaps dementia issues. And so I think that uh, when he was asked, of course, and maybe not asked, but he provided the information to the government, he told them that this isn't why people are moving into them, and he was solidly ignored. <laughs> so it's not like something that we haven't seen in the past. Um, and so Homer Folks, he, he died on February 14th in 1963. He lived in the Bronx, and he was 95. So he lived with his daughter. So clearly his daughter was the caregiver for Homer. So Homer did not end up living in an almshouse or in a skilled nursing or in, in a nursing type of setting. So he was an advocate that we were very, very happy to have. So seeing a culture shift has taken a, a very long time. They're not incarcerated, they're not prisoners, and goodness knows they're not dangerous from that perspective. They're residents, they're people. Um, so that's been a very difficult you know, difficult thing to come to grips with, that that's how people were treated back then as well. Right, changing mentalities, mm -hmm. changing language. And county homes then went under privatization, and when that happened, uh, it simply just changed their entity, but the residents and supervisors stayed the same. So this inmate, inmates that were classified as private care allowed institutions to receive their resident monthly annuities from the federal government. So basically it's the predecessor to how we've ended up with Medicare and Medicaid. Exactly. So in the 1950s, the intent of policymakers was to destroy the um, house, had succeeded. And however, there are many older people who needed services, as Homer folks had pointed out to the feds and did not respond to positively. In 1954, Congress passed laws that allowed for development of public institutions for older adults. So finally, we had both private and public nursing homes, similar to what we have today. Um, they were all provided federal support. So whether a nursing home is private or a nursing home is a public or uh, 
nonprofit or profit for profit, uh, can be provided with federal support. In closing the almshouses, policymakers gave birth to the modern nursing home. So for better or for worse, right? <laughs> so in 1954, the Hill-Burton Act provided grants for nursing homes built in conjunction with hospitals. Unfortunately, that's why one of the reasons they were actually modeled after the double-loaded corridor, the poor lighting, and the non-access to outdoor space uh, that we currently see in the wards that we've seen designed in hospitals in the 1950s. Uh, small business administration loans were also made available for standalone nursing homes to be built. In 1965, Medicare and Medicaid was actually permanently put into place, providing reimbursement for care, created a strong private sector growth for the nursing home world. Between 60 and 1975, number of nursing home beds dramatically increased along with the revenues because it was a definite revenue stream by providing these services. And that's the area where you got not just the semi-private rooms, but what we call the quads or even eight people in a room. Right which is not how people live, that would definitely be a hospital model. Exactly. Um, that we would The try ward. To, the ward, the ward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Inmates, ward. Yeah, exactly. Even the, even the nomenclature all the way across the board really reflects that, doesn't it? By 1980, 80% of institutionalized elders resided and received care within nursing homes, uh, which is not no longer the case in, in today's society. The large uptick in the nursing home industry led the US Department of Health to discontinue a large portion of reimbursements. So initially they were provided for long-term care. So capitated rates are now put in place. So I know that the hospital industry in, in recent years has been really upset about being capitated. And I look back and think, we've, we've, had, the, we had that experience. We've always had yeah. this experience for a long time in the long-term care model. So if we start to look at institutionalized care and the corridor and the double double loaded corridors and all those different images. So you know that institutional model had led to a lot of our design of our buildings to be just that, very institutional, not home-like whatsoever. Possibly isolated in location. Right, we have long corridors uh, that would isolate even a person within the facility, not just in terms of a rural location or even a, a urban location. People never would go in, never come outside again. You know, people have been institutionalized for 10 or 15 years. That still happens, unfortunately, where they never even get to go outside. Long corridors that people can't get down that's just too far to travel, very poor lighting, highly reflective service. You know, we still, we still, even in this day, have the myth that shiny is clean, and we have the reflective services that people are afraid to walk on. They're not quite sure where they're going. Unfortunately, we're starting to have newer product that do doesn't require wax and doesn't require other things that create shiny surfaces, but it's also the lighting, the lighting and the design of the lighting, the access to the daylight and how that's utilized, and the length of the corridor preventing people from actually engaging at all and no resting spots within the corridor. Exactly. This reminds me of the original um, nurse call system in the hospital model, which was bef before they had electronic nurse calls, where a resident would or at the time an inmate would throw a shoe in the hallway and the nurse would know who to respond to because she would recognize whose shoe it was. Oh no, <laughs> what a way for identification. <laughs> and it took them what, 30 years to actually identify false teeth because they used to lose them and they'd end up in a bag with everyone else's. <laughs> so you never know. <laughs> the shoe and the teeth, that could be our new, that could be the new you know, criteria for older nursing go. homes we're trying to change. And the old idea of the, uh, what we call care station now, which is, which is really, devolved as, as well or evolved into something else um, where the nurse's station became sort of like this, the, the warden's location, glassed off, private, separate, uh, and really didn't provide interaction between the caregiver and the residents, which was exactly contrary to what you were there for. Right, and trying to have, allow for engagement and allow for access. Uh, and I, you can always tell when you work with an administrator where they're like, well, they're on their side or they call them them, um, exactly. the others. They don't even think of them actually as people. And, and so refer the, to the humanization the, side. Exactly, the residents sitting around the care station when you have that kind of a scenario, and refer to them as the puddle because they just spill around that area. Um, because that's really where things are happening. That's where the activity is. There's nothing happening in the corridors. And there's nothing else and no other place to go. No so else they're to gonna go. be where people and interaction and actually they, occur. Right, and they can't get outside. Bad lighting is one of the worst. It's one of my, my pet peeves, I think, forever. But I noticed uh, in a community recently that was renovated that in their dementia wing that was from that period of time, they had these huge stop signs mounted to the inside of the doors as though someone with dementia was going to understand not have that drawn attention to it right so just the fact that they told them to stop you know i came into this unit and uh, they still called it a unit and a ward and there was a re seemingly a resident who went through the door on the other side 
her name was Alice. And I was like, uh, all of a sudden I heard, Alice, where are you going? So I just opened the door. I'm like, Alice, I go, there's someone here to see you. You know, and she took my arm and we walked back in. And I think a lot of times people are a little bit afraid of those with dementia too, to see where and how people interact and how they can interact with them. It's unfortunate in some of the old models, there's lots of equipment that ends up in the corridor. And I don't think anyone lives in an environment where there's equipment in the corridor. So that's a big criteria that we have to design spaces where we can get those things tucked away, where they're nearby and serviceable to the residents uh, and facilitate the the work of the caregivers. And don't you think that technology has changed so much too, so that we didn't used to have certain things that everything was already in a, in a residence room. So you have these different carts, you have electric lifts, you have all these things that were never even in the planning process when they were actually developed originally. Exactly. And so there's no space allowed for them. And the 80 square foot rule for a person living and an environment was 80 square feet. Many regulations in many states still utilize 80 square feet as the minimum. Which is just unrealistic for unrealistic. A, a normal life. Yeah. So in 1970s, the abuse in nursing homes became a national scandal. Part of that was because there were no regulations. So the fact that regulatory measures started to be putting in place and were introduced, it started to actually become nursing homes similar to other healthcare settings started to become more regulated. So we started seeing things that were similar to the outcomes of the workhouses of the 1800s and the almshouses of the 1900s. So that that triggered a whole bunch of different things. So then I think sometimes you can swing a pendulum too far and you can become a little bit overregulated. Mm -hmm. So I think in some ways we've lost again the sense of home and we've overregulated overcompensated to be overcompensated mm -hmm. for safety. So in the 1980s, the nursing home population included a large percentage of residents with serious mental illness. That was when states were closing uh, state hospitals. So a lot of folks ended up in the long-term care setting. And so at the time, they were the state hospitals uh, were housing the mentally ill without federal funding. So that's why one of the reasons that folks started to intermingle. And so an elder with different issues and care needs does, definitely doesn't want to be necessarily in the same setting as those with behavioral health or mental health issues. As a result, the incentivized local and state governments to shift the cost burden to the feds. So different things started happening as a result of all of that. So we had the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, prevention of placement of those with mental illness in nursing homes. So that started to allow that the population to get the care that they needed in the right environment. And then the Nursing Home Reform Act from 1987 increased freestanding nursing homes and provided rehab services, Medicare. So that's what we would know through the 1990s and still today is how it's set up. So more older adults then as, as now fear being forced to spend their final days with institutionalized nursing homes. And that- Because they need the services, they don't necessarily uh, want to be in that setting, but they need that level of care and they're not able to afford to have it in their own home. Right, and often the fear is still something that people still, that's no right. matter who I talk to or what group I talk to, if it has older adults as part of a focus group, that's one of the things I talk about is the actual fear of being exactly. moving into it. So rehabilitation facilities are standalone as well as located in conjunction with long-term care and uh, palliative care. It also mixes your reimbursement. So you have rehabilitation uh, is usually through Medicare and then you would have Medicaid that would support the long-term living. And so that has added a balance. So it's kind of, we used to have more private pay in long-term care and then the advent of assisted living moved a lot of the private care residents who didn't need quite as high a level of care into a nicer surrounding and a more home-like type of setting. So the needing of care for those with dementia has increased exponentially, and that's one thing that we're still seeing, uh, and other forms of cognitive impairment that need to be addressed. And then there's provision of hospice and end time care uh, for residents is also being addressed within the nursing home marketplace. So the coupling of capitated reimbursements for long-term care and the institutionalized nature of care brought about this onset of assisted living. And so assisted living fulfilled that niche of an improved private pay solution. Because I think families, a lot of times, the adult child, there's some guilt there in terms of, oh, mom needs some additional help. And the nicer the environment, the better I will feel about this. And so they put together this intermediate level of care. Over time, we've seen the acuities, though, in assisted living go up and up and up. So we actually can see three different levels of assisted living, you know, type of resident within assisted living settings now. So it's actually uh, taking care of a higher more frail person, higher acuity for a more frail person, and predominantly those with memory care issues. So I thought, Maria, we could talk about culture change too as our next step from transitioning, not just from the care model, but then the actual movement of culture change and what's happened. Absolutely. And so I know that Joe strived to have a non-institutional solution for his friend Mel, but when looking for a long-term care setting at that time, different models were just 
starting to be evaluated and completed, but not very many out there. There's been a movement to positively change the long-term care marketplace. Maria, can you describe the focus of this change? Absolutely, sure. Over the last 20 years, there's been a strong culture change movement that supports resident-centered care, some people call it person-centered care, uh, to provide as much autonomy and celebration of a resident's life while providing health, care, and support services that are required to maximize the quality of a resident's life. Jane, so we've talked a little bit about some of these options. You hear about the 90-10 rule. Can you explain that? Sure. The 90-10 the is sort of this idea that we have 100% of our life. And I think people think that when residents need to move into an institutional setting, that they need to do so because it's their whole life, and it's not. So I call that the 90-10 rule. 10% is the reason why you're in a long-term care setting, because you need the care, the support, or the services that you need, or you have dementia. But 90% is the rest, is their life. It's the person, and right. it's the unique person of that. So I was working in a community one time, and I talked to an administrator, and I said, hey, I go, what are your residents like? And she goes, well, I've got two that have dementia. I've got one that has high blood pressure. Well, it was all diagnosis-based, right? And I said, no, 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 no. What's their favorite color? Who do they like? What's their friends? What did they used to do when they were, you know, when they were living? And they didn't know. And they had no idea. Yeah. Really sad. I it mean, really sad. But she did take a, an aha moment and went, oh, I don't know, but those are really good questions. So it kind of goes to show that we could do a lot better with that. So two movements that are related in developing uh, resident center care are the Eden Alternative and the Greenhouse Project. Can you talk a little bit about those? Sure. So the Eden Alternative came about from Dr. Bill Thomas. And, you know, he's a little bit of a hippie but with a really good idea. And he's a, he's a physician. And he realized that people weren't necessarily going into long-term care and dying from disease. They were bored. They didn't have a purpose. Uh, they didn't have anything to really live for. Um, so one of my favorite examples of the Eden alternative is a, a older gentleman had fallen and broken his hip. He had already lost his wife. His kids came and said, well, we're going to go into this nursing home because you need to do rehab. And he, he just kind of given up living. He didn't really have anything that he really wanted to live for. So he kind of curled up in the bed. And so Dr. Thomas had them place a, a pair of birds in his corner of his room. And he'd watch the birds and he'd watch and see what the birds were doing. And he goes, uh, the nurse came in, somebody else came in to look at the birds and feed them. And he goes, you know, they really like their water on the other side of the cage. And he was like, oh, well, right. then Holy why cow. don't you, time to get up, right? So, <laughs> so he got up and started taking care of the birds. And then they had a dog that lived in the community and that kind of stuff. And so he took the dog out for walks and he started to get better. And so instead of just kind of curling up, giving up, he got a dog and went home and, you know, went back to his living on the outside of, because he could in the, in the real world, real world, you know, versus an institutionalized setting. And so the whole idea was, is that what if you made or thought of a nursing home being a community center? No, people don't usually have that image. You know, it's usually a, a stinky, uh, glary, institutional, scary loud, place. Loud, loud, unfriendly. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted to change all that and had programs where kids would come after school as a regular day program. It wasn't a, an activity, a planned activity. It was something that just happened as part of normal life. So also Bill Thomas uh, decided that part of the limitation to the Eden alternative was the physical environment and the develop of the physical environment. So he realized that what if how do we live at home was like how we lived in an institution. So it seems like a really simple idea. Most people on the outside be like, well, of course, you get to get up when you want to get up. You get to eat when you want to eat when you're hungry. You get to sleep as long as you want to. You bathe, bathe on when your you own want schedule. To. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. And so when you talk to someone outside of our industry, they're like, oh, well, that makes total good sense. Why wouldn't you do that? Of course you would do that. And that wasn't the case, though. So in institutionalized care, basically, you get somebody up at 4 a.m. or start getting residents up at 4 a.m. so that by 7 a.m. they're sitting at the table, they're having a meal, and they're dressed, and they can't figure out why they're falling asleep at you know 11 o'clock. Well, clearly, if they're used to sleeping until 9 and they're 90 years old and they're used to having toast and coffee for breakfast at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, of course they're not <laughs> going to be doing very well. Um, so that whole idea brought about the idea that, well, if we shifted this, what, that, what would that look like? And so this idea of creating a larger home. So 10 rooms, 12 rooms at the most, surrounded by the hearth, a residential kitchen. You cook the meals inside the home. You have a living room space. You might have a den. You might have some little bit of support space right, for staff. Right, a similarly scaled environment. Right, mm -hmm. right. So it def definitely felt more like it would at home. And uh, they, Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, Steve McAlilly, 
agreed to do this experiment with Dr. Thomas. And when he agreed to do the experiment, he was working through it and they found that folks they moved out of institutional living into this environment, people who hadn't walked, started walking. One woman, she started singing. So it gives me chills thinking about it, watching the video. Uh, she started singing. Uh, she hadn't spoken yeah. in, in years and she started to sing. And so this idea that humanity got put back into right. the, the nursing home People model. were able to feed themselves. Right. Exactly. They ate more. Interested in eating. You know, right. You know, versus, uh, you know, my grandmother lived in a, a very nice assisted living. It used to be a school. It had been remodeled into an assisted living building. She couldn't stand insure. And she actually had some very derogatory terms about the crap, this crap, I don't wanna, you know, use this, right. blah, blah, blah. I say to grandma, I go, well, grandma, what do you do with the insurer? She goes, I pour it and flush it down the toilet, no one knows. <laughs> because it, to her, it didn't taste good. So this idea of, of smells and the aromatic side of cooking and bringing food to residents and allowing them to participate, you know, cutting vegetables. People are like, oh, well, someone with dementia having a knife. Well, if it's something that's very common to them of cutting vegetables, it's in context. I mean, clearly you have to know the resident, know their resident profile very well course, yeah. um, to be able to do that. But it, it makes it changes and shifts the idea. Um, so being this long ago that this was started, we're still not seeing a complete tipping point on changing environment, but that was a big step in the right direction when the greenhouse project first came, came about and then was replicated uh, through foundation monies to be able to continue to do more of them. So there's over 200 of them now. So both assisted living models and nursing home models can be done in a, in a small house. So that's the other thing too that's kind of a misnomer that people think that you can't do but one kind of care in a small house. You can do any kind of care in a small house. Any group of people who have any kind of commonality, almost like a co-housing model, mm -hmm. could utilize a small setting for extended care of some type. And so I think the whole idea was to be able to have access to the outdoors. You know, people would be like, well, what if you just let them have free reign to the outdoors? And they're like, well, we can't do that. But if you can see them and staff can monitor them, why not? And if you put a couple of hooks next to the door that have a couple of coats on them, people who, even with dementia, you walk outside your chili, you would think to, you know, you put on the coat. Right. It's not an absence of, of uh, services. It's really an access to services, different, different things, the outdoors, different views, a different way of life. Mm-hmm. And thinking of daily life as part of your activity life. Exactly. So it doesn't have to be a, everything be a planned activity. Because that's not really life, right? No, because it evolves naturally. Yeah, so it has more normalcy to it. Uh, the idea of all, everyone eating together on a big table, um, that he called that convivium, Dr. Thomas did. He was great at, at different kinds of names. Uh, but this idea of bringing people together so that not just residents came to eat there, but staff would join them or Jeff, staff would be utilized to help them if they needed help. And, and families all of a sudden got interested in wanting to participate because it felt more like a, a, a real home setting. Right. You know, something that they might have, you know, their family member would have enjoyed. And people wouldn't be afraid. So children wouldn't be right. afraid to come visit any longer. So they would come and spend time with their family, whereas in the institutional setting, they wouldn't ever go. So that idea that the small house brought more people and more visitors to come also made it more normal. And the outside of them would fit into the context of wherever you had the location of a home. So it can be in an urban setting, which I think is sometimes people don't understand. But if you lived in an urban setting your whole life, it'd be very strange to be out in a suburb somewhere with a white picket fence. Um, whereas the in suburban area, you might have something that looks like a large ranch style home. Um, so contextually, a small house can be, if you think of small house as a care model versus small house being the built structure, it could be in almost any kind of different format. So you have uh, at the heart of the home, generally a, a kitchen like area, and it looks just like anyone's residential kitchen. You can have uh, food available, snacks available to the residents just like, so they can access them themselves. Um, generally, the, the caregivers or the staff um, can be universal workers and they're providing um, all of the care for you know, a variety of residents. Um, and it's just a much more natural env environment. They get up, they help them get dressed, they get their breakfast in a, in a much more natural setting. They may do nice housekeeping, but they're interacting in a, in a much more normal uh, scenario just as people would in their daily lives. Yeah, I have a, a colleague and friend of mine who has a Garden Spot Village. She's the executive director, Steve Lindsay. And I have this one photograph that comes to mind for me. It's these three ladies sitting with their mugs, and I call it the mug shot. Um, but they all get up really early in the morning and come in before anyone else does into the dining room. So they sit at the counter and have their cup of coffee, and each has chosen the, the mug of choice. 
and one of them being styrofoam uh, because yeah. it keeps her coffee the warmest, so right. she likes it that, that way. So that idea of so choice. So they get their favorite things. Mm -hmm. Their Absolutely. favorite things, choice, the dialogue, they learn the gossip of the morning, um, and they get to participate in all of that as part of it. Um, from a code perspective, we hear a lot about the open kitchen. Like, how can you do the open kitchen? Is that allowed? Is it not allowed? And, and, and it's been and, a code challenge. And it's been a code change. So That's right. So NFPA has actually changed the code, and that happened because of the Rothschild Foundation working through it. Um, Rob Mayer was a huge proponent of changing uh, for culture change, positive change for resident-centered care. And they were, had a committee, a task group. Uh, Amy Carpenter worked on it a, quite a bit. Uh, and she was able to, with a group of people, uh, put together different responses to the NFA, NFPA code um, to allow for the open kitchen with a much more residential appeal and not having the huge sprinkler systems and the large scaled hoods and all the other things that were not only expensive, but very but un difficult. Unfamiliar. Unfamiliar to right. residents. Right. Which, which would not uh, get the residents to want to participate in any of the activities in the cooking, which they had normally done. So using it as a filter of always asking, what would it be like if it was at home? Is exactly. always a good, is a good filter to use. So the accessible snacks to the residents is just, it's a great thing. Of course, depending upon uh, a resident's situation, you, you have to be mindful of what's available. But it's just so appealing. Yeah, and it's tricky because some, some groups will have, if they're really institutionalized staff, what other people don't realize is you can't just build a model like this and put things out That's and that type of thing and understand it. They, staff have to be trained. So when... I approach with clients, work with clients. They'll be like, well, I want to do a small house or I want to do a household, which would be maybe connected small houses. I go, you know, you can't do that unless you're willing to change your care model. And uh, recently I had a client come and she goes, you know, I thought this was going to be tweaks. She goes, this isn't tweaks. She goes, these are changes, Big like changes. In systemic changes in terms of how we do care. And you don't want someone not to succeed by giving them something they can't operate. And, and some staff will embrace it and be able to move on. And, and others are more familiar with the older style of, of care and make it hard to adapt. And, and culture change is tough. So in the Facility Guidelines Institute that develops the residential guidelines for code, we found that we have we still have the traditional because you have to have guidance on how to renovate traditional houses and, and traditional uh, nursing home settings and other senior living settings. But we also tried to get them to look at the household, look at a neighborhood, look at a cluster, look at a different way of providing care in a different type of setting. And it was interesting to do it because the... Uh, you almost make people feel a little guilty if they don't go beyond traditional to at least see what else they could do because now we have a guidance system that the authorities having jurisdiction can utilize to be able to streamline it and actually be able to evaluate against some criteria. The greenhouse project was initially used in uh, suburban and rural settings, which required uh, a substantial amount of land or to be attached to an existing retirement community or uh, medical campus. Uh, in Mel's case, he lived in an urban setting. Um, can you talk a little bit how the greenhouse could be adapted uh, in an urban setting? Yes, there's a, one example I like to use is Stadium Place, it's located in Baltimore City. And Stadium Place uh, is a moderate to lower income community that has two HUD 202 apartment buildings, it has two tax credit buildings, and it now has a uh, mixed income apartment rental project as part of the community. And when we first started doing the health planning, we did the health planning on the project, we advised them to evaluate uh, this uh, certificate of need that we were able to get donated from Johns Hopkins. So we're doing an evaluation of different care services and what was available and what could help people. Because uh, Jack Sharp's vision, who started this project and had carried the vision um, all of his, his career, wanted to see that moderate and lower income seniors could also have access to a continuum of care like you would find in a continuing care retirement community setting. And so one way to do that was to be able to have extended care services and assisted living because it's private pay was a little too expensive. So what, what was a way to do that? And so in, in doing their analysis, we were working with Johns Hopkins and they were deregulating some beds. So that certificate of need for the beds, we were able to transfer that to them and they didn't have any problem doing that. They did it for a dollar. So they basically held on to that certificate of need. At the time they were like, I don't really completely understand why. And I said, because at some point when you do that extended care model, this will allow people who live in other 
moderate or lower income settings to be able to have some of the same opportunities, uh, to be able to extend their care, have it in a household type setting or a small house type setting. And so at Stadium Place, they were given the opportunity to do the first greenhouse project in the state of Maryland, uh, supported heavily by the state as well. Um, so here we were able to do a multi-story urban setting uh, within the Baltimore City area. And the residential scale too, I think that's one thing that is something that's missing in a lot of long-term care settings. And so this idea that you have the hearth, you have a living room feel, but it's connected to a kitchen and it's connected to a dining room, has so much better association with home uh, so that everybody knows that they can be part of that and they can be part of a, a home process. And I've just seen such a huge difference in terms of the outcomes. That exactly. That Residents trade. don't typically live in, in large rooms with um, shiny finishes, uh, that with, with echoing walls and that sort of thing. So introducing the soft surfaces and uh, uh, upholster things, things that are comfortable, things that are familiar, uh, accessible to activities, or things they want to read, or even the, just the TV. It's just so much more comfortable. By far, yeah, I really believe so too. Some of Joe and Josephine's friends aren't interested in moving away from their existing communities. So they, they've had uh, long-term friendships, uh, community relationships, that's where their faith community was. Have you worked on projects for extended care in existing communities? Yes, I have. And one of those is the Wharton Care Center. It's one of my favorite case studies to talk about. Uh, it's a small house model that was modified um, utilizing two households. So it would be basically a duplex if you were talking about residential terminology. And it meets the needs within a small town in central Tennessee. And Uplands Retirement Village is actually located in Pleasant Hill. There isn't very much in Pleasant Hill except <laughs> Uplands Retirement Village. Uh, it has an assisted living building. It has a community center. It has a church. It has other pieces. But when you were driving along, you would know you just wasn't weren't driving through another small town in central, you know, central Tennessee. And so when we started working on it, uh, I actually was an accident. <laughs> so Jane Heald, who was a resident, she was in her 70s at the time. Uh, Jane Heald had been talking to an engineer that we had been working with on different things, and we had been to a clean med conference together. Um, and uh, Kim Shin from TLC said, well, if you really want to talk to someone who knows green building as well as long-term care, maybe you should talk to Jane Rohde. So I became friends with a resident first before I knew anything about the project itself. And so Jane was part of the green team. She had four people. One of one of them was uh, lived in a geodesic dome in the community. I mean, very interesting people. A lot of missionaries, uh, well-educated. Uh, a lot of them were teachers in, in different disciplines, but always in that learning mode all the time. And so Jane and I worked together and she was on the sustainability side, but she hadn't really talked through the idea of- How it applied. Yeah, and, and care model changes. And so there were three committees, one for hers, one was this care model. Um, they had our friend Betsy Brawley's book tucked under her arm and, and flagged on every corner for looking at the different- <laughs> Like mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah looking at the different uh, aspects of, of designing for those with dementia. And then they wanted to also continue with that and, and look at uh, what happens with the rest of the building and could they do like a health and wellness center. So they're really ahead of their time in many ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I loved working with the, with the residents. And so uh, a little longer went by and a, a group was looking for uh, a consultant that was working on the project who was going to put in the request for proposal. And they contacted me, not because they knew that Jane Heald had talk to me, but also, again, because the engineer had recommended them talk to me. So that's how we ended up actually working on the project itself. Um, so that was kind of a neat a neat way to, to get, get involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very serendipitous. So in, in developing the Wharton Care Center, the interesting part was we did a lot of mock-ups. We did all kinds of mock-ups. We And we used like tape on the floor kind of mock-ups. Uh, and one of the architects that was working with us, Bruce McCarty, he was in his 80s. And he kind of was like, why would you need a place like this? Because he still went to work every day. And so we would come out of Knoxville together and we would talk together on the way, on the ride to Pleasant Hill. So we would get the whole background. And so, you know, every project you do, there's always something that doesn't come out just right. But boy, when you look at this compared to the institutional setting of where they came from, huge difference in terms of that. Hit the mark. Hit the mark. Yes, for sure. And some of the details that go into designing households and this idea of the great rooms are things like indirect lighting, access to being able to see outside, views, the horizontal lines of being able to get homostasis from being able to see the horizon line. 
all those things we were able to achieve. And in this case, where we looked at doing all the cooking in the kitchen, at the Wharton Care Center, we decided that they had a really good cook. It was one thing that they really liked, which is not usually the case in institutional Sure, let's say typical. Yeah, yeah, very atypical. They didn't want to lose her. So they basically built two small commercial kitchens between each duplex. So there was two little commercial kitchens. And part and she of moved it, back and forth? She would move back and forth. And part of that was because of fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> because in Tennessee, yeah. you don't take fried chicken away from anybody. <laughs> right, right. So, so that was able to, to be able to respond to that. And then still having the resi residential setting so that they could still access coffee and they could do other activities and things like that. that were but it's really nice to be that mindful of the residents' desires of how they wanted to have. That's the, the meals are one of the most important parts of the day. Absolutely. So to be able to maintain that and also maintain the situation for that particular um, staff person is just amazing. Again, relationships. Yes, I think relationships are so key. We also ended up with skylights in the in the project that weren't original because I we didn't do the con construction administration part of the project or the contract administration, but we had I found out that they had taken out the transom windows they'd value engineered out our favorite term value engineered out the windows above uh, that created transom windows into the garden. So I get this call from Jane Hield, of course, because she videographed everything from the inception <laughs> to the final step. She had a little orange vest she used to wear out on the site because they were worried about her. So the workers all knew what the Eden alternative was. Everyone knew what it was. And um, she had uh, called me and said, you know, I'm, I'm really not happy if I end up living here. There's not enough daylight. I said, so what are you proposing? She said, I really want to put some skylights in. And I said, okay. So we figured out where to put them, how to locate them. She raised the money within the community at large and was able to fund the first household. And once they were installed, the administration could not say no. Um, and so they put them in all the households. <laughs> oh, so continue. So, That's great. Yeah. So you want an advocate, but from an administration perspective, a little could be tricky, but it, she definitely is the advocate for making this the best place possible. So how we knew that the Wharton Care Center was a success is I did a walkthrough. I went through with the Green Committee when we were done and took photographs and things. And there were some things that were really kind of screwy. But then I walked back into the old building and I was like, oh, yeah, this, this, is, this, where is, we where, were. this is where we were. So then a few, few weeks later, Jane sent me a note and it said, uh, I wanted you to know that we've reached success. And I was like, well, what, is, wow. what does success mean, right? So she called it a farrago. And a farrago is like a, a potluck dinner. You know, it's basically a, a mis different group of things that are kind of miscellaneous and you get together and you have a gathering. And what had happened is one of the other independent living residents that lived in the community had come back from a mission trip and wanted to share it with her friends. And in order to do that, they had a friend that lived in the nursing home. They're like, oh, it's going to be tough to get her out of the building. I don't really have complete access in my independent house. Um, how are we going to do this? And then it dawned on them that they could bring the party to her. And so they were able to bring it into the community and, and share it. Right. And the nursing home became the community center. Right. So they all came in, they performed each other, they had talked to each other, they shared a meal together, all those things. That they were aha were, moment. The aha moment. And so for me, that was a measurement of success and keeping tabs with Jane, because I still do. She keeps, she, we're in touch and we work on different things together and she always lets me know what they're doing. And so that's the part that's just the fantastic, right? That, that this really did do what we, were in, we set out Jane, to do. Yeah. Jane, in replacing the existing building with new, what did the community do with the old institutional building? This is a common issue uh, in our country as to what to do with older, out-of-date infrastructure buildings. At the Wharton Care Center, what they did with the existing building is they created a health and wellness center out of it. And so it achieved, it took several years, but they were able to achieve one of their goals of the three groups of the independent living residents. So that was one of their strategies was to create uh, activity center or health and wellness center and looking at that. So they actually developed an aquatic center. So the construction um, was completed in 2016 in the summer and they did a wellness center that included a 31 bed Medicare A and B certified skilled nursing and rehabilitation therapy center. So when they completed it, the included an occupational therapy uh, kitchen and bath designed to help stroke heart attack and surgery patients relearn how to best navigate in their own homes. So this idea of maintaining their highest level of independence and it created a state-of-the-art exercise facility. So it benefited all the residents that live in Upland's uh, retirement village as well as looking at the evaluation of those who needed to go into rehab to, to and stay. And one thing that's really neat about that is bringing the existing residents to the building, having another purpose, mm -hmm. so getting that cross um, 
uh, population of, of from the different buildings. It's really a neat opportunity. Yeah, and, and utilizing it, you know, and, and they even included a cafe, and we know that the cafe has been a really strong feature at, in most it's communities for redevelopment. It's the hub. Just like, instead of it being the nurse's station, right, now instead now it's, it's where it should be. Absolutely. It should be the cafe, right. Um, and so it had fresh foods, you know, that for patients and the guests and Uplands Village residents could use it and the local community. So they're even bringing out the community at large. Which is also new, welcoming it. the outside community. Yeah, right. Exactly, exactly. And we've done some programming work for other clients who've also looked at everything from repositioning from a health and wellness perspective. This idea of bringing the community at large in is huge. And so how do we develop community that's senior living? Because senior living has been isolated too long. And so how do you really engage a community at large and have that normalcy if you can actually have be part of a community fabric? And so by doing that, you can add all different kind of components in it. One, uh, one client actually looked at including a hoteling model so that if someone went through the inpatient rehab and then from inpatient rehab stepped down to outpatient rehab, but they couldn't manage their own home. They created a motel, medical motel a concierge idea. Type concierge type mm -hmm. service, yeah. Services. So they could stay there and still do their outpatient. And then they would have a handoff, a physical handoff between the outpatient physical therapy with the fitness wellness center. And so they kept the continuum going. So not is the uh, the continuum of business, but also the continuum of improvement for a resident. And it's full oversight. Mm -hmm. And completely integrated. Great. But we know it should be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With memory care being the largest growth market and Joe wanting to help his son with his home health care business, what other kind of creative examples are being developed? So one that's really interesting to me is Abe's Garden. And I found it sort of accidentally. I was looking through some awards uh, in who, you know, we want to know who wins what, right? And Abe's Garden was in there. And it was talking about designing an environment that could be a continual research opportunity, a living model, if you will. And so what interested me the most is the architect uh, who I spoke to and, and asked for permission to talk about and show his, his program in different continuing education classes and things. He goes, oh, please share it. I love the idea. You know, this is what we're doing. His experience actually wasn't in long-term care. His family's business was in long-term care. Oh. And so he ended up being the one to design it. So he did his evidence-based design research process to find what are, the, what are the best things to utilize? Why is it the best? The daylighting, all the different pieces and parts of what would make a good place for someone to be able to live. But also being able to benchmark outcomes so that he could share those outcomes with other communities and other people who are also developing memory care settings. So I was like, this is great. This is like the living model. He truly lived it. Truly lived it and wanted to give it back enough to be able to well, and he understood it. the issues. Being an architect, he could understand the issues so that he could really provide that kind of information for other projects. That's amazing. Right. Isn't that great? And so I, I show this one image of their community center where it's an activity room, like a garden, almost garden slash activity room. And I was in a group of millennials recently and I was presenting this and it was students at Clemson. And they were like, wow, that's, if that's cool. What, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's what long term care is looking like. I could live I'm there. <laughs> yeah. And we're seeing that as a, as a movement, too. We're seeing people that uh, younger students and things like that, right. uh, music students looking for housing, that type of thing, moving into retirement communities and becoming part of the community fabric. Um, that's starting to move it in the right direction and starting design community, not designing senior living as exactly. we think of it. Uh, there's a community in the, in the Netherlands that's a very interesting idea. It, they call it Dementia Village, and it's self-contained. But what it has is different cultural hubs within it. So one might be focused more on music, one might be focused on a different culture, one might be focused on a different type of cuisine. Artwork, cuisine. Uh, so Indonesian, for example, is one of them that, that they look at. So this idea of actually taking something and allowing people to live and choose into different community settings based on what their backgrounds were. So it goes back to talking about resident profile and understanding what is important to people and then being sensitive to that as, as you're not just designing, but also where and how the care model works to support that. So and other, other creative models that we've seen is I spent a week in Denmark, and Denmark has the opposite issues that we have in terms of building, whereas we're trying to deinstitutionalize folks and, and move them back into the community and have more of a community home-like type setting. They do more predominantly home health care. And because of how their social system is set up, that's how it's always been completed 
to take care of older people. So if they get up to 15 home visits a day, that really becomes almost impossible to keep up with financially. So they've been trying to work on innovation. So they have innovation centers in different regions in the country to help people evaluate what technologies will and will not work for them uh, in terms of helping people be able to be more independent. Uh, they actually provide physical therapy as like we would provide medicine for a cold. You know, they think about it like, well, let's let's do let's do this so that we can help people be able to maintain their own ability to take care of themselves better. So they have product innovation and toilets and grab bars and showers and sinks that move and toilets that move and things that we don't, haven't even really thought of in this country in terms of helping people age in place. And so with that, they've created environments that more of some congregate housing now to actually bring people together so they can do some care inside. Households for them are a natural. So they, they have a, a hearth room, much more modern in design because it's, it's in Denmark. So, you know, that, that Danish modern never went away because it's Danish. <laughs> so therefore, a lot of the environments will have that living room and the, and the kitchen and the family room spaces and people come in and out of them just like they would their homes. And then their smaller apartments are adjacent to that. Very smart in apartment design, doors that are wider, doors that can be expandable and open so that the bedroom and the living room can become one room. Uh, just very smart thinking of the future of how to make it adaptable, adaptable, adaptable to allow people to receive services that they need. Thinking about Joe and Josephine, who have a good friend named Genevieve, um, they visit her often and love her community and that it's designed as an intervention for improving lives. Uh, full of purpose, you know, creating an intergenerational opportunity. Can you talk a little bit about how that model works? I would love to. It's one of my favorites. So Generations of Hope model, uh, using terms such as intergenerational model, it's basically an example of that, as a global descriptor. It's used as a model where you can take a vulnerable population. So one of the vulnerable populations, for example, would be young women aging out of foster care with a child and you surround that group of vulnerable population with a group of seniors that purposely want to live with that group of folks and help build that community and help be an inner support. So the support grows both ways because it's basically using community as a true intervention and using it as an intervention with a small amount of staff because you have to have some staff to kind of bring things and pieces and parts together to kind of be a little bit of the glue. Mm -hmm. But the idea is the community itself is what provides the actual, uh, the actual intervention and the actual opportunity for a vulnerable population to also have purpose while an older adult can also participate in that and perhaps become a tutor to a child provide babysitting services so a young mom can go to work, uh, provide educational opportunities, uh, share a meal together. One of the, the calling cards of doing an intergenerational model is always having a room within, whether it's a small apartment building or it's a larger community, but always having a space where everyone can get together and share it on a regular basis right. because it becomes part of the community. I always kind of think of it as the, the, the church supper in some ways because you would have everyone come together the potluck kind of idea. A little bit like co-housing too. Like co-housing, yeah, exactly. So you have a, a common theme why you're all there. You're there for a purpose and it has, you have common uh, ideals, common goals, you know, common interests, because that's really where co-housing would be wrap around it the same way. The original one was in Rantoul, Illinois, Generations of Hope called Hope Meadows. And that community were children moving, trying to move children out of foster care into adoptive families. But the adoptive family parents never had enough support to actually be able to bring them through to adoption. So by adding this senior component, they were able to provide this intervention as a community. And, and then it, as time went on, they realized they also then had to take care of the seniors as well. So there was an interchange going back and forth. One of my favorites, favorite settings, uh, Generations of Hope type setting, is Genesis. Uh, it's located in Washington, D.C. It opened in 2015. And this model took about the uh, idea that young women aging out of foster care who had a child and wrapping that with seniors. The difference in this community, though, is most all of the seniors are still working. So you also have uh, how many service hours someone can actually volunteer might be offset a little bit by the fact that they're still working individuals. Um, I also found that there was every race was there, every faith was there, and one of the older seniors, a uh, Latino woman, also had uh, a young child uh, who had grown up who had uh, Down syndrome. 
So you also had not only the children and the exposure and the multi-generation, but multi-racial, multi-faith, uh, and it's a very small community, but amazingly tight in terms of how they can work together and help each other. How I knew the model was really working is during the opening, they had a big bulletin board up and it's a community board. And Miss Jessie had left her name and number and said, so anyone needs babysitting services, call my number, or better yet, just knock on 102. Oh, that's <laughs> so great. That's how you know that it's really working. Exactly. And, and so seeing those kind of models really coming about. Um, another favorite I have is Bastion. Uh, Bastion is for wounded warriors. So we have a lot of young men and women coming back with traumatic brain injury uh, and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, multiple amputations, a lot of uh, previous wars people would not have necessarily survived. And uh, this young man, Matthew, uh, one of my favorites, uh, he was the only person to survive his unit. Mm. And so him and his mom uh, have been very strong proponents of Bastion. Uh, it's located in New Orleans. Uh, the young man, Dylan Tett, who started it, uh, had come back to from I Iraq to uh, Katrina. And his wife was teaching school in a pizza hut in Lafayette, and he had had a first child while he was gone. Wow. And so he has since had another child, and he has been a strong proponent of creating Bastion for Wounded Warriors with a the seniors being a component that wraps around that as a vulnerable population. And this is interesting, too, because it can be more dynamic. So if people wanted to then uh, you're, you're healing, you're better, you've, you've improved your own outcomes in terms of this community, Say you wanted to then buy a home. Well, if you bought a home in the same Gentilly area, you could still be part of the community, and then you of Bastion, and then you could also still participate, inter participate and interact. So it's it's a community at large issue. It has really good services actually for traumatic brain injury in the New Orleans area as well, and they have the new Veterans Hospital that's just opened recently. So Genevieve, where, when we go to visit Genevieve with uh, Joe and Josephine. Uh, the other thing that I think that Joe and Josephine really liked a lot is the community garden. And the community garden, it's used to teach children about organic food, and it's to help the community. So it's a, it's a way of connecting community at large with a community that's intergenerational, uh, in addition to providing healthier food uh, for, for different people and educating for nutritional values. And so I think that there's also, that's the part of what Genevieve really likes, because uh, before she moved to the community, she used to keep a small tray uh, and she always raised African violets. And so she always had a, a, a touch and a knack for things that were green. And so I think the opportunity to participate in the community garden has been really important for her too. And I think Joe and Josephine really like to help out on the with the farmer's markets well, I, on the weekends. I, at the Generation of Hope model, showing the kids where the food comes from and making it available, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. And, it, and it's tough because I've worked with kids that are from the inner city and I've taken them to like state fairs and things like that. And I had one little girl, she was 16. She was hiding behind me and I go, what, what's the matter? <laughs> she was like clearly scared. And there was this huge pig that was going across <gasps> it. It just had piglets. She had never, she had never seen a live pig before. She didn't wow. know what it was. She's like, what is that? You know, it was like <laughs> alien. Yeah, it was not an alien. So it's just really interesting to see what kids might think. Jane, there are other aspects of um, being outside that Joe's identified in his work, um, things like resetting uh, circadian rhythm, the ability to get vitamin D, um, just the, the joy of being outdoors in nature. Uh, what other examples of exposure to daylight and sunlight can you share? Oh, so daylight, boy, our friend Betsy Brawley here, she comes to mind, doesn't she? She's Absolutely. always talking about yeah. the advocacy of getting good daylight and the balance of good light and the importance of it. Uh, whereas in the U.S., institutionalized care can prevent residents from ever going outside. I worked on a community, actually, in uh, LaPorte, Indiana, and I found out that their long-term care setting was inside of a hospital, so that was one part of it, one of the reasons why it had this situation, but it was on an upper floor. And I asked them, they said, no, we have residents who've lived here for 10 years who've never been outside. And I just couldn't believe it. Uh, so this whole idea of culture change is, and resident-centered care really is promoting this time for being outside. In our project in China, access to the outdoors is incredibly important, and it's demonstrated by their focus on gardens because they're always outside. Any time, any green space, small green space, first thing in the morning, you always see people doing Tai Chi and other activities outside. Um, but in addition, they have a requirement that on the shortest day of the year, you have to have 20 minutes of, of sunlight in your living space. So basically, all of their residences are all placed toward the south. So you can't have double-loaded corridors. 
So it creates a whole different way of looking at how you gain access in outdoor space. Uh, even on each floor, it's a because land is very expensive there. Uh, it's usually leased from the government. And, but you see multi-story buildings, and with those multi-story buildings, each floor has its own outdoor garden uh, so that every everyone has access. So people with higher levels of dementia perhaps can't navigate as well, will always have access to the outdoors. Uh, the entire back garden behind the entire building was also designed so that it could allow people to have access and, and you never know that you're enclosed. You know, so it doesn't feel like you're trapped in a small space or anything like that. And it gives, we have like three levels of security for unwanted exiting uh, so that people don't even realize that they are in a space that they would try to get that out of. That has any kind of limitation right. to it. Right. Jane, knowing that Joe and Josephine enjoy visiting Genevieve's community, what are additional drivers for the next generation of communities and the future of successful, desirable living? It's, it's interesting because I think evaluating communities that integrate different generations, but also include access to services, amenities, and care, but friends and family. So it's not as though people all want the same thing. So I think that that's the one part of the 90-10 rule is that each individual is unique too. So they desire different things. They have different preferences, different choices, that type of thing. So those that want to remain in their homes need to also have services made available. However, it is establishing community that will make the difference for the future. So it's basically having all those community connections that we need to be able to still be able to live the way we want to. So having choice and being given options is, I mean, that's what we want, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about it as the compound affectionately between the two of us. Where, where are we going to retire? Because everything that's out there now is not to the tipping point yet. And so how do we create community that would be good for, for us or for our families or for our friends? Because um, I think we're all looking for something that's a little bit different and better than what we have now. So I was reviewing the top 25 places according to Forbes to retire uh, in 2016, it came out. They all have things in common. People have less, less income and more time for activities. So lower cost of living is important. Uh, attractive lifestyle features, good or desirable weather. Like in some, it might be cold weather. Like my father, he's not moving out of Buffalo because he still thinks it's moderate climate. <laughs> so <laughs> that man is never gonna, you know, Florida to him would be horrible. You know, he hates the humidity. It's, it, you know, all those pieces and parts that, whereas my husband would prefer it. So there's also that, what is desirable weather? Uh, even Fargo, North, North Dakota, fell on their list of their top desirable. 25 of desirable. It was a location in, wow. in North Dakota. But for people who enjoy colder weather, it makes sense. Uh, cultural and educational offerings, depending on what people's uh, interests Interest. are. Mm -hmm. Physically active, focusing on health and wellness. Um, and volunteer opportunities, because I think that volunteerism is a, a big part of it. Um, but there's another several additional ones that I think need to be brought up that are maybe not as quite as obvious as the ones that were in the, in the article. Uh, so many seniors need job opportunities. Uh, we haven't quite have the same situation where people have a guaranteed pension enough in retirement. The recession has set them back, um, many different reasons. But a lot of seniors want job opportunities. It may also be not even full-time positions, but it's more desirable for them versus something they have to do because it's something they enjoy. They it's their vocation. It's their vocation. It's what they've kind of identified themselves as, is what they do. Um, so the working senior is not often being taken into consideration and the large portion of the 75 plus contingent really wants to work. And so, for example, the Genesis seniors that we talked about in Generations of Hope model, but also another gentleman that we talked to in a focus group, he lives in assisted living and his wife lives in memory care. He's 85 years old and he still has a consulting practice. And we were holding him up a little bit because he had to do a conference call. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we know that there's if people even in assisted living are still, some are still driving, some are still working. Um, some are still very, very active, uh, particularly if their spouse has a need. Sometimes people will live in an assisted living apartment because of that. Originally, they lived in assisted living, and then his wife moved into the memory care side. And they also refer to him as the additional caregiver because he's in the cottage so much where his wife lives that he actually knows all the staff, and the staff all know him, that he's almost become like a volunteer staff member uh, by default from being there so much. Um, something that's not 
surprising is the access to transportation, transportation services. Predominantly in the rural and suburban areas, we really haven't done a very good job of figuring out how that transportation is going to kind of work. Um, we have seen in some areas uh, like the Beacon Hill Village, we've seen that in Columbia, Maryland, we've seen it in Sausalito, California, where they've started putting together the virtual community. And the virtual community uses exchange programs for getting transportation. Sometimes they use, um, you'll give transportation for somebody one day and then they do something else for you another day. All that kind of uh, building a chit model, kind of a barter system um, to allow for different services to be exchanged. Uh, access to healthcare services that are reliable and consistently managed. One of the problems we really have is the follow through of care. So if someone's going to be at home, how do you still manage that and use a care management model? Uh, the onset of the patient-centered medical home model, which is an outpatient-based model, is part of that wraparound service of always evaluating how do you care for somebody and how do you consistently follow that person based on their personal resident profile. Uh, and then some places we look at of having the 211 line or the longevity hotline is what I was referring to it, where people have some place to call to get the information that they need for doing that management piece. And I also think that uh, additional services needed as unique situations occur. So maybe you have a temporary change in your life, but it's not permanent. For example, if you had a knee replacement, you might need certain services, but only for a certain time, versus if you had paralysis from a stroke, it might be more permanent. So how do you adapt to changes in your life and how do the environment adapt to that? Um, I think opportunities for and access to extended care services so that Jane Heald's a great example. She lives across the street. She watched the entire building being built. She's participating now with the, uh, the center that they've developed as the aquatic center. She hasn't needed those services, but she has those services. She knows all about them. She knows where they're located. All her friends are still there. It's all familiar. So it's within their own community base. So I think looking at extended care services that are more decentralized is something else that we're going to be seeing. And then you have your natural access to groceries and other amenities while maintaining some autonomy. Uh, so uh, I had one resident that I'm very close to, Miriam Zosnowski. She lives in a nursing home. She had a stroke on one side. She lived in a continuing care retirement community. And one of the things that she liked to do was go to lunch on the independent living side so she could visit with her friends. But Whom what I didn't- she firmly lived with. Yeah, exactly. That she, her sister still lived on the independent side too, but her sister wasn't strong enough to wheel her because she was dead weight in a, a, a wheelchair. So it was a very, you had to be fairly Rigorous. strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I almost lost her in a bush one time. I had to have some help <laughs> and make sure that I didn't, you know, because she really was heavy just because of that, uh, the condition um, and the slope. Uh, but the, uh, I think that, what I realized from going to lunch with her was that it was an, not just an outing for lunch, it was an outing of seeing people, visiting, stopping at the hair salon, see who was getting their hair done, who's doing an activity, and stopping at the little grocery store because she really wanted to be able to pick out Make what she Make her own wanted. selections. Mm -hmm. And so it's one thing when people bring something to somebody, it's totally Which different. Which is wonderful, right. right. Um, I know that a lot of people don't like to grocery shop. I'm one of those people that really like to grocery shop, and they're always like, well, why do you like to do that? Like, I like to pick out my own vegetables, what I'm gonna cook. It gives me some thinking time, and it, it gives me a, an opportunity to have choice of what I'm going to do. And I, I think that people lose a lot of that autonomy as they age. Right, you lose your connections to the normal pieces of life. Yeah, and I don't think that has to be that way. Exactly. And so I think that that would foster, within the community, that's what we wanna see. Um, and I think the idea of always doing things for someone instead of allowing them to do them themselves, uh, it, it creates a dependency that doesn't necessarily have to occur as well. And then a reduced ability to do things independently. That's right. That's right. Because you get used to it and then, you know, whether it's muscle tone or, you know, just the opportunity to doing things on your own, it, it diminishes. Um, which I think is how in the double loaded long corridors, how we've ended up with a lot of people in wheelchairs. Exactly, because they can't make that long trek mm -hmm. and it's been done for them. In, in, and in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the staff's trying to meet a schedule. And uh, so I think that that's a, a big part with, of it. With all good intentions that it started, but the end result ended up being negative. That's right, that's right. So I think choices, dignity, sustained freedoms, those are all things that we would look for in, the, in communities and community design. Uh, one community that was built in San Jose it was interesting because it was a, you didn't know that it had say anything about senior housing. It has a community center that's adjacent to it. It was a separate project, but they were able to integrate the two projects, one being housing, one being a community center, wider sidewalks for naturally being able to pass two 
motorized vehicles or wheelchairs at the same time, opportunities to go and have a meal, go and have an activity, do things that you would like to do, but it's just community living. It's not talking about things from a stigma perspective of being older or just that aging in place, because that's what we all want to do, is age in place. You know, it just, it's a terrible terminology. Um, so we do use that term longevity more and more um, and just community, because I think we're really designing community for the future. We're not designing anything that's really senior living in, in a sense. The other part of it is, is integrating the community that you're designing for. So providing opportunities for residents to have access to transportation, have the grocery store, have a, a medical uh, setting or an outpatient setting somewhere nearby um, that's all within a safe environment. We know that safety and security is really part of it. We also know that if you're designing for a certain community, embrace it and have that community come into your meetings, your focus groups, your functional programming process to understand what people really want to have in their community. Um, and so if you can meet that, yeah, it's like win-win. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know why it wouldn't happen. <laughs> well, it hasn't been more obvious. Yeah, and, and for some reason, for uh, the design community, uh, being able to engage with community at large more and more is really nece necessary. We've seen it with the sustainability movement, but we haven't seen it as much in the senior living and sustainability as a combined effort to try to raise the bar for what we're designing for community more universal design, um, not going by minimums of 4% for HUD, you have to have accessible units. Well, what if all the units were accessible, but they didn't increase square footage? You know, could, could we do that so that more people could live there longer? Um, and I think that that, uh, that kind of mindset hasn't really evolved very much in, in the design world. Um, but we're seeing more and more creative opportunities where people are talking about continuum of care, but not in the sense that you and I would have been familiar with it for the last few years of, of continuing care retirement communities or continuing care that's all about seniors, but continuum of care in terms of the whole population or the population health or community in general. Um, so I think that that's exciting because that starts to really talk about planning and looking at cities and looking at neighborhoods and looking at how you design buildings in that context. So nothing is not designed in context any longer. Mm -hmm. um, Joe's daughter-in-law has been looking for options for one of her parents that has dementia. With his background in adult daycare, he was able to provide recommendations for settings that provided resident-centered care. What are some of the trends and characteristics of adult daycare providers? You know, adult daycare is really interesting because that it, is an opportunity that's very underutilized in our country. And for some reason, it has a bit of a stigma. And uh, it shouldn't. There's no reason why. Uh, it's a great opportunity for people to be able to shift toward using kind of a household model in an adult daycare so that the caregivers, the family, the adult children have the respite time they need and or go to work every day or have the sandwich generation they're taking care of kids and they've got work and they have a, an aging adult parent that has some issues. Um, predominantly adult care, daycare works really well for folks with dementia. Um, and we see adult day healthcare often because adult day healthcare also provides reimbursement for certain care services, uh, medication management, uh, and different types of uh, care personal care, in, personal care. So if you have difficulty at home or it doesn't accommodate doing a shower for someone in a wheelchair, you can have a shower at the adult daycare. Uh, so those are all really good reasons to utilize adult daycare, just like we would use childcare. Absolutely. It's, yeah. and, and it still allows that person to live at home. That's right. That's right. And still have their familiarity of, of what their own living area is. And provide some respite for the caregiver, whoever that might be. Yeah. And, it, and it's hard. I mean, it, you know, taking care of anyone who has early stages of dementia or later stages of dementia is a very difficult job. And, and needing respite is very much part of that as well. Um, so this idea of taking the household model and now putting it into the adult daycare model, you would have a residential kitchen, a dining room, and a living room. Uh, so one project that we worked on, uh, actually, we find that square buildings, for example, work a little bit better because you can do different kinds of day rooms and, and settings within a building and still have very good observation sort of from the center point. Um, but we also realized that co-locating things like uh, the outpatient rehab 
is a really good opportunity, then they can have uh, residents that are, are there are participants, as they're called for, from a regulatory perspective, in adult daycare be able to go to outpatient rehab. Uh, they can also have uh, one community that I saw that was a, a really interesting is they did the 211 center, like the, the number center. They had a Meals on Wheels program, and they had, uh, I believe it was another agency for the adult daycare, and then they had a part of a PACE program. So they had the the program for all-inclusive care of the elderly as, as their adult daycare that had the full wraparound services. So they really maximized, really, really thought, thought through. through, right, mm -hmm. so that they could use that kitchen for multiple purposes and, and help fund it in many different ways. So I just thought it was really clever in terms of getting agencies to work together and putting that together. Not an easy process, but really effective. And the idea of having coming in because uh, adult daycare participants don't all get there at the same time. So they have the bus that goes pick up, picks up people and brings them in, or they're dropped off by an adult child or the caregiver. Um, so being able to come in and say, oh, I'm going to have a cup of coffee, or it's first thing in the morning and, you know, Mr. Rice likes to come and have his tea and ha read the paper while he's waiting for the other participants to come. Um, many centers are open longer hours, just like you would for child care. For daycare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same same kind of premise. Uh, we also see that there are mixed populations often as well. So you might have a group of developmentally disabled residents that are also or participants that are also using the adult day center. And, and as a result of that, you may have different activities that might be of interest. So a pool table, uh, you know, a foosball table, uh, something that's a little bit more physically active for developmentally disabled may be appropriate uh, versus something that you may do for uh, a group that's not as mobile uh, or a group with dementia that needs other in you know, other activities, yeah. Um, quiet rooms are pretty popular. We, we get into this kind of discussion about the snoozeland well, room. Yeah. What's, what is that quiet <laughs> what room? What is a snoozeland yeah, room? What is yeah. a quiet room? What does it look like? Um, and I think it's really the idea is, is taking someone who's agitated, no matter who or what or why, um, and allowing them to be able to be calmed down um, through sensory experiences uh, is probably the simplest way of describing that. Um, we've also worked with developmentally disabled out in Las Vegas with Opportunities Village and fascinating to do focus groups with those folks to find out what is important to them and being able to apply that to their work center, their, their care center, their education center, their, their daily uh, activities because it's basically adult daycare in a sense because they've aged out of, of school, so they've aged out of programs. So where do you go with developmental disability so that you could even be employed or looking at different uh, potential and possibilities for their future. And Opportunities Village does a really good job with that in Las Vegas. Josephine had a hip replacement and knows during her recovery that universal design features were very important. In anticipation of her next planned surgery, what would be important details um, to be evaluated to ease her recovery and allow her to complete her rehab within her condominium? So in completing post-occupancy evaluations, I think you found this as well, It devil is in the details. Um, so allowing things that really work from a universal design perspective are not, again, not stigmatizing. They're actually fairly simple. They just need to be consistent. Uh, so there are many details from lighting to even transitions between floor surfaces, um, utilization of contrast correctly, so that the wall is contrasting to the floor versus you know, movement on the floor because of too much contrast. Uh, locations of grab bars, the right height for grab bars, all of which can either support independence or they can create dependence. So the goal being obviously to create environments that are more supportive of independence. So in that independence, people have to not be afraid too. What I've really noticed in the work we've done in China is that as you're evaluating how people move through a space, where are the handrails, where are the points where you have contact, and are people feeling safe enough to be able to transverse an open space? Because most of our household designs all have open space at some point. So you can have handrails in certain areas, but not all. So how do you create confidence for that? How do you place things based on a resident's needs? Um, we've also found, occupational therapists have even said, where a chair is located exactly. might be a, a, a resting a spot. prime resting spot or, place to, or a place to lean against and, and specifically placed because you actually, if you watch and map a person within their own living space, you can get a pretty good idea of how they move through it and what they utilize. So knowing that helps us design spaces better. So I think contrast is huge in terms of that. And so you have a lot of experience with working with, with contrast and finishes and things. So what examples do you think of when you think about the contrast? And well, what well certainly see? knowing where the edges of things, you know, understanding 
the floor plane and contrasting that with the wall plane. Um, occasionally, that you'll, you'll need to have a, an appropriate base to a wall so that it defines an edge and people know to ambulate along that direction to get to a particular location. N things to not be shiny because that'll restrict movement uh, for colors, the values to be appropriate one to the other so it doesn't look like a hole or it doesn't look like it pops up towards you. So color is very, very important. I guess it would also be in terms of seating too, so that if you have a, a floor seat that doesn't contrast with the floor and it looks the same, you misjudge you the edge of the chair. You don't know where it is, chair, exactly. Right? So helping to locate things in space is, is part of how you can use color and contrast. Um, and then your great example of the, the perception of the hole, like the dark center of, of a carpeting with a light edge, and you see residents sitting on the outside edge, and you're like, why is that? They're afraid to move. They're afraid to move. They're afraid to fall, so they won't head in that direction. And I know one of our friends always tells a story about the gentleman who was sitting in bed and she asked him to get out of bed. She's a nurse and she asked him to get out of bed and, and he goes, he started rolling up his pants and she looked at him and she says, why are you rolling up your pants? She goes, well, I don't want to get my pajamas wet because the floor was perceived as wet and shiny. Because it was so shiny. So it was so shiny. So even the, the perceptions and, and understanding the perceptions of that. Um, I also think adjustability and flexibility are, are details too. Uh, we've looked at different grab bar systems. Uh, Presley Care is one that we've looked at and, and others that have adjustability. So this idea of doing the adjustability of up and down, in and out for grab bars to meet the person's needs, um, adjustability of sink heights, whether it's manual or it's, it's electric, uh, being able to locate it according to someone's height. Makes a much safer environment. Mm -hmm. And, and so people feel safer too. That idea of putting the slit in the front of a sink mm -hmm. and being as able a grab to, bar. as a grab bar, um, a place for a towel so it's close by so you're not reaching or stretching in, a, in an awkward way. I, I think all of those components are, are really important. Uh, and we, we really noticed it in working in China because of course people are smaller statured, some, not all, but majority are. And so we also realized that our arm heights where we might use- Completely a, different. Yeah, 26 inches. 24 might be the max of where you go. Um, we found that with heights of tables. Um, we did find too that we use more wall-mounted toilets because we can clean under them easier. However, in our country, that not doesn't as much. work because of the bariatric component. Mm -hmm. um, however, what it does makes a lot of sense if you're using um, towel bars that have a grab bar capability, weight capability. If someone needs to ambulate, they have they can hold on to what looks like a. Uh, towel bar, but it functions like a grab bar. It can still put towels on and that sort of thing. Or if someone slips, it's something solid they can grab onto. Because you really don't want them grabbing a hold of it if it is a towel bar because it's ripping it right off Abs the wall. Exactly. So you really need to only install things that are safe. Absolutely. Right. And I think that that's sometimes missed. And we've seen even recently, we went through a walkthrough together and we saw the building where they had grab bars in kind of odd locations and then they had towel bars and they were the same color, not quite the same size, you'd never be able to differentiate that if you were a resident trying to get in and out of those different areas. Right, and the lighter duty ones were truly unsafe. Mm -hmm. The other thing we found strange in, in China for some reason too is the light switches are all located much higher than we do here. And so that was something that I wasn't anticipating because we have a standard for that. Um, and so we did have the outlets raised some and we had the night lights with the amber lighting, you know, and, and evaluated that. Um, but the light switches themselves are a little bit high. So that's something that we're going to, we adjusted in upper floors once we looked at that from a contract administration perspective. So when we talk about cultural responsiveness in terms of design and even universal design, I think it's really important. What I didn't realize is that they actually even made log cabin wall covering. <laughs> so I was in, uh, in uh, Michigan and it was in a veterans community, uh, long-term care setting. And it was the first time I'd ever walked in and they actually had this log cabin wall covering. They had animal heads mounted that were eyes following me around the room. They had firearms in a case that was unlocked and <laughs> left within the nursing home. But it's home. what was familiar to the residents. Exactly. So it was cultural responsiveness and uh, the staff really got it, you know, in terms of that. Uh, the adjacent rooms to this were the, I apologize for mauve and teal for the rest of my life, but it had the border and it had the white glary floor and the TV that was going and you couldn't really see outside, although it had a courtyard outside, you couldn't see it because of the glare off of the floor and the glare of the light. Um, and then I came back into this kind of strange space with the animal heads and the whole nine yards. I have to tell you that I understood it was for the population. So I think a lot of times as designers, we want things to look a certain way because we have a design aesthetic that we have in mind, but we also kind of forget the residents that we're really serving. Who's uh, truly living there. Mm -hmm. And I think you really, it really hit it in, in terms of that. And the contrast was great for me because I saw what 
obviously the designer, the previous designer had done and then versus what the, the new. The, they had done for the residents themselves. And there was um, no ammunition nearby. Not that I know of. <laughs> uh, adaptability as well um, with uh, bathrooms is that we also look for storage opportunities for personal belongings. And for some reason, it often ends up being over the toilet. <laughs> and uh, it's not something I quite completely understand because it almost ends up in the toilet. <laughs> so we've been trying very hard to evaluate spaces uh, to include storage that's accessible, reachable, um, allows residents to be able to have their personal safe, belongings located there. in a safe way to access in it. In a safe way. We also know that with memory care, people have a tendency of putting things in the toilet anyway. So being able to maybe secure some storage as well um, within a resident room, uh, particularly for memory care, is a good idea, but also allowing the things that they can have access to, easy access to. Um, and like you would at home. So recesses in the shower, opportunities to have cabinets in storage, uh, all those types of pieces that really create uh, an environment that would be usable for a resident. The dual grab bars uh, on either side of the, of the toilet gets you away from that clearance from the sidewall, which was, of course was an ADA recommendation that really never made sense for seniors anyway. Um, so it's a much safer option. It gets everything within reach, uh, allows independence, also allows you know the grab bars to be moved back if they're not needed for a particular residence. So that's really a terrific detail. And I think that detail can also help if you do have someone who needs two people to help with a transfer. You can actually fit. Yeah, you get the, the butt space for someone to be able to bend to work with someone and then speak for yourself. <laughs> I will speak for myself. <laughs> Uh, the other area is bathing. Um, bathing is a really interesting one because operationally people have difficulty with it um, because if they don't assign someone to actually really work a bathing program, it's really hard to achieve it. However, the other problem is if you have to be in a lift and, and get swung over on a lift, have naked. some na yeah, be naked and have some dementia and then you're plopped into water, Something about that whole process that just doesn't, not a good one. Um, so one of the tubs that we look at, at using has the, uh, has the reservoir where the, you put in the warm water so it fills in quickly, but it also has a, a gate that allows someone to sit down in a chair and slide into it and then the water fills up around a person, which would be a little bit more similar to how you would do it at home. Um, we do find that showers obviously are easier, but the soaking of the tub has so many therapeutic opportunities and uh, that we really think that, that it's a good thing to look at. But it's the type of tub, how you build it in, how you provide storage, indirect lighting again, utilized right. in it, not making it feel like an institutional locker room. Creating more of a spa environment as an, ex an experience since the residents are not going to be there independently anyway. So to really cr create a, a much different kind of experience. And, and so we, and we want it to be a positive experience because I know right. when we did one renovation that it did look like an old locker room and it was no wonder that it was used to store, you know, shower chairs. <laughs> it was not used for any kind of bathing. Um, the other trend we're kind of seeing too is that particularly in renovations, um, if you don't have enough space for all the different kinds of amenities, doing the, utilizing the toilet room, um, not just for the spa, but also maybe using it for a hair salon or utilizing it for an activity room or utilizing it for other, other folks, so having two entrances right. with it. Um, also doing the hair salon as part of the bathing core so that it becomes more that spa type of experience. So thinking about the adjacency of some of those elements. Mm -hmm. Could be, could be really important. I think the detail too of, uh, we think of universal design of different heights as well, but also eased edges. I, I'm still surprised how many times I go into a community or space and I still see a sharp corner or an edge that's just not gonna work. Um, and so just, it, it's simple, but it's something that can really create a bruise or a bump or a cut on or somebody. Or tear, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for people who have thinner thinner skin as they get older. Ah, the transitions on the floors. <laughs> it's great when you have products that there's hybrid flooring now where you can actually weld um, the resilient flooring product to the soft goods, which is just terrific because people can just roll right over it. It's, it's uh, same height, the products for the same height, uh, moisture barrier back. So it's really a ter terrific innovations in the past 10 years or since Joe's been doing this, it's just <laughs> night and day. That's right. And I think that um, the, the speed bump you know, a lot of, uh, I'll talk with uh, uh, firms that aren't used to doing things for seniors predominantly, and they'll be like, well, it meets ADA. Well, ADA still allows you to have a quarter inch difference in height or, and Which will trap inch. people in their rooms. That's right. It will trap people in their rooms or not allow or them to get into out, a space, yeah. right? Or they can't wheel over there uh, with their wheelchair or even a walker and shuffling. I've seen people get hung up on it. Well, I think, I think the whole idea of being able to self-propel safely is huge. 
let, allowing people to choose where they want to be and be able to get there safely independently is a wonderful thing. And allowing the movement. So the more you can think about your environment being safe and mobile and, and positive distractions and, okay. instead of being caught somewhere. Or I think that's one of the issues we have with memory care anyway is that people are get agitated because they aren't allowed to move and wander and, and do the things that they want to do. Um, and this and is something that at the same time, it, it saves the caregivers. It, it makes their much less fatigue for the caregivers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. From talking with Joe, Josephine, and Genevieve, there's a strong request for sustainability measures to be included with their, within their environments. This is demonstrated by Jane Heal's commitment along with the Green Committee and the sustainable efforts that are resident driven at Carol Woods Retirement Community in Chapel Hill. What is the direction of sustainability in senior living environments? The drive of sustainability um, as well as a movement toward health and wellness. It includes not only the building applications, but also operations and quality of life. So for the most part, I find that developers are still hesitant to try to get into, you know, like the certification of, of their buildings and things like that, unless you can show an operational life cycle assessment that actually demonstrates cost, cost benefit. benefit. Right. And I think part of it is also what is the goal of the developer? If it's a developer who is in senior living temporarily to flip buildings, then that's not the developer that's going to be looking at sustainability or even no. operational cost. Um, predominantly, the people that I like to work with the best, nonprofits and for-profits alike, are ones that are actually looking at trying to sustain longer, um, improve outcomes. Uh, they want to. They want to make. They have margins, obviously, um, but they also want to look at the quality of life. And so those are obviously our preferred clients. Um, but I think that sustainable can be taken in a lot of different ways operationally. So for example, uh, Carol Woods that you mentioned, uh, Carol Woods has a sustainable food program. They, the recycling program came about because of the residents, not because of administration. So I also think that the continuing care retirement community level, the generation that we are in now, like we don't think anything about having recyclables at the curb, right? right. Well, when Joe, first started out 1999. Unheard that, of. It was unheard of. People didn't do that. We actually have um, composting mun municipalities that compost. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Portland, Oregon. Other places are looking at it all the time in terms of how do you improve the sustainability part of it. Carrying your own grocery bags, right? We never would have saw anything like that. That was not there. Um, so you see this whole movement, and actually it's more, it's even like in Jane Heald's case, they wanted it for themselves for the future. Um, indoor environmental quality is really important. Um, I think looking at how they do sustainable cleaning, I think there's definitely a movement for that. Uh, one good friend, she's actually set up a company who actually does that with sustainable cleaning. Um, she came to uh, China to teach how you do sustainable cleaning from an infection control perspective in healthcare. So there's a lot of different things that can happen in the sustainability world that are more operationally based. And I think those are the ones that people are looking for in senior living. Um, I also think the natural lighting piece, um, energy and water conservation, and it's mostly tied to the dollar. Because whereas in, in other types of healthcare settings, there may be more of a budget in long-term care, it's usually a more limited budget. Um, so I think that it's looking at the, that value, that life cycle value that we're really seeing the most of. Um, and there's an interesting example right now called the Heidelberg Village. And I thought it was interesting because it looks at things as a living community. So, so this whole idea of the access to green, the green roof, the whole piece of it, I think there's a lot of things there that could really be uh, taken into the sustainability and, realm. And applied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we never would have seen this before. Like the outdoors that we're seeing in the Heidelberg Village is very similar to what we're seeing in China. So this idea that, and, and for China, it's something that's so second nature to be outside. Um, they even still have their laundry hung out. So people will say, oh, well, where is that where you have laundry hanging out? All buildings have laundry hanging out where people live because that's their custom, because the UV rays are to kill whatever bacteria you have. And it's something they don't use dryers in everyday life there like we would here. And so that's why you have outdoor spaces too, is because they always hang their laundry out. So it's just an interesting way of thinking about how other cultures view the out of doors and then how do you incorporate them into senior living. I'd like the, the green vertical component in the building. Mm -hmm. The idea of having greenery built into your building mm -hmm. as a system and what it does for indoor air environmental quality. I mean, it, you know, we saw that in Denmark as well, a lot of large green living walls. And I think part of the reason they did the large green living walls was because uh, being outdoors is so cold there because um, I was there like January, February. It was very cold. Um, but they use a lot of the green walls to be able to keep the green 
available to them. Um, in one of their innovation centers, they also had a glass that was developed that you could actually sit near. And so you could be near the outdoors, but be in, indoors. Mm -hmm. And the light would come through and they did the glass, formulated the glass so that the rays that create development of vitamin D would be allowed, allowed through, through the glass. Isn't that you know, great? Brilliant, yeah. right? I mean, it's something that's not completely operational yet. It's in its, you know, no, but infancy. Particularly but in that climate, though, to give that accessibility mm -hmm. is fabulous. And the idea of the technology being able to develop into that is amazing. So as we talk about living communities, I think it's really amazing that Joe has come all this way in 18 years of time. All the innovations that have happened, the developments in technology. I think he and Josephine would really appreciate that folks like us are trying to move the market in the right direction, um, and that many others are as well. Uh, we have so many folks that are dedicated to the senior living market trying to move it toward the future of designing community for people. Uh, the examples for, of where Genevieve lives and how Mel had an institutional setting, but how could we make it better? And so I think that that's the challenge we want to put out there to the architecture designers, providers, developers, anyone who's working in this marketplace, including the authorities having jurisdiction, to try to make a difference for the future. Absolutely. I think Joe and Josephine are role models uh, for us things that we want, whatever their goals might be, what we see demonstrated for them, for their family. That's really what we want to work towards. We want to be challenged by their desires. We want to make those kind of things happen. Some of the examples that we've looked at um, here are, are things to emulate and improve upon. Just keep studying it, keep working at it, and um, we'll see where Joe is in another 18 years or so. Thank you, Maria, for being here today. This has really been great to talk to you about all these things that are so meaningful to both of us, but it, utilizing Joe and Josephine as the perfect couple to help us explain what's important as we age. Well, thanks, Jane, as well. It's really been a great experience, and it's been a terrific opportunity to share with everyone where uh, Joe and Josephine and their family has gone and, and what the opportunities are and really how it can help all of us uh, move forward and uh, evolve the industry. Really looking forward to it. Thanks so much.